We want to welcome everybody to our Hebrew Prayer Warrior training. This is our, we're still in our first session, but this is our final week. So we're excited. Everyone excited? Yes. All right. We're just going to open up in prayer. We um, do praise the Father for all the wonderful things he has shown us. And even in this session, he's going to still show us even more stuff. As we pray, Father, we thank you now. We bless you. We ask your presence as we go into our training session. We thank you for the three previous training sessions that you've given us. And we ask you today to still be with us. Let your Ruach, let your spirit give us revelation that we thought we never could have in the scripture. We bless you now. And we thank you for all these prayer warriors that are raising up to a new level of understanding, raising up to a new level of prayer in their life. We bless them and we decree that they shall see the results of their prayer, not many days hence. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We're going to start out just talking about the word prayer. And we want to take a, we want to take a, um, I would say a biblical basis and prayer, just to start out, is simply communication. Communication between you and the Father. And the word that you will find most often used that has the strongest definition for prayer is going to be pa'al. And it has a very interesting meaning because when you go back and you look it up in Hebrew, it means that it's one that's bowing down before and asking the person in authority to grant their request. It's almost like pleading to the judge to give you your request. And of course, in, in Hebrew thought, the judge is supposed to, want, supposed to be the one that restores life. He's supposed to judge with righteousness. And this particular word gives us a picture. And the picture is a picture of a mouth and two shepherd staffs. So, everybody got a mouth in here? Got a mouth? This is the ancient paleo for mouth. And it's an open mouth. It's not... You know, you don't see the lips, but it's an open mouth. It means authority. Or to one that speaks with authority. And then the shepherd's staff. And what's the shepherd normally do? He safeguards the flock. So when you, Paul, you are actually speaking to the one that safeguards the flock. Speaking to the one in authority. Very interesting, isn't it? Has great meaning. So, it's, it's like I said, it's a picture of speaking to the one that has authority. And of course, you know, the final authority was with the shepherd. So in your communication to the Father, it's not just simple conversation, but there has to be a recognition in you that he is the final authority. Because sometimes people are praying, and guess what they'll do? They'll go around and get all their friends' opinions. When they already spoke to the one that has the final authority. So I ask you, what does an opinion matter if you spoke to the one that has the final authority? Opinions are just like, um, <laughs> well, we leave that one alone today. Some of y'all had some reminiscence there. Now, our key, one of our key scriptures comes from, and we're going to be talking about the purpose of prayer next, comes from Luke, the 11th chapter and the 9th verse. 
And it says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he that seeks find. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Now, our first purpose in prayer is relationship. Relationship. That's our first purpose in prayer. Let's go to Exodus. The 33rd chapter. And it reads there, and the Lord, or Yahuwah, said unto Moses, spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not from the tabernacle. Now, what we gain from there, or want to get an understanding of, when you're talking to someone, your conversation has greater meaning when you have relationship. When the person knows you. You're more likely to entertain Deacon Carroll's talking to you than someone off the street that you don't know. Because most of us have a relationship with Deacon Carroll. We've known and some of us have known him for years. So when we're talking, because we have a relationship with him, then our words tend to flow easier. And for those that know him intimately, you might tell him more stuff than you might tell a stranger. Anybody tell a stranger all their business? I don't know about you, I usually test folks out to, to see if they're worthy um, hearers or worthy friends. Test drive them. If I tell them one thing and they go back and tell it, then uh, they get cut. <laughs> it won't tell them anything else. So relationship plays a huge part in our prayer lives. How can you pray to somebody that you don't know? How can you talk intimately, tell them your innermost uh, secrets, your innermost ambitions and things you struggle with if you don't know them? And what we want to do is establish a relationship similar to Moses. We want to be able to talk to the Father face to face. And when I say talk to him face to face, we want to be in his presence, have an audience with him. Know that what we're speaking, he's hearing. Now, this relate, I'm going to show you how powerful this relationship factor is. Go to Proverbs, the 28th chapter, and the 9th verse. And just in case you don't get all the scriptures, I will be disseminating over the next week a copy of my slide presentation so that you can have access to all the scriptures and go back. And see him again. Now this is a very powerful scripture here. Because if you listen to it. It implies there's a relationship going on. Or should be going on. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law or the Torah. Even his prayer. Shall be. Abomination. So a person that you know, you tend to listen to, don't you? So what the father is saying, to know me, you got to obey my commands and statutes. You have to follow my instructions. Because first and foremost, he is the father. He's father and you are the what? Children. Children. And the child 
is commanded to, in the natural, to obey your parents. To honor your mother and father, and that would add long life to you. So if this is your, if that's your natural parents, how much more should we talk about our heavenly father? Obeying him. Whole lot more. Let's go to Psalm 66. In 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord or Yahuwah will not hear me. But verily, Elohim has heard me and has attended to the voice of my prayer. So this is a this gives you an idea of the life we're supposed to live before him. And one of the things that can cause your prayer life to be ineffective is sin. Sin causes a death not only to you, but your prayer life, it, it can desecrate it. Okay, let's go to Proverbs. Fifteenth chapter. And the twenty ninth verse. The Lord or Yahuwah is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. Now, what's our definition for righteous? Or what's our righteousness? Deuteronomy 6 and 25. And basically it goes, it should be our righteousness if we observe or guard to do all his commands. Statutes and precepts. Very powerful. So, the first thing we have to do if we want to establish a tremendous prayer life is to have relationship. And, and the relationship comes in, it, it's, um, is cultivated in two ways, through his word and through his spirit. Through his word and spirit, those are the two ways you cultivate that relationship. Now, anybody ever had temptation? Oh, yeah. Ever been tempted? Oh, yeah. You could have, it could have been a man, could have been a woman, it could have been food, it, it could have been an object. It, there are uh, just a, a numerous amount of temptations. But prayer will help us there. That's our second bullet there. Prayer will help you resist temptation. Go to Matthew 26 and 41. Very simple. Watch and what? Pray. Pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, our next point is obedience. He has commanded us to pray. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. One famous writer said, life without prayer is like living without air. You have to talk to the Father. You have to talk to him. And Shaul, or the Apostle Paul here, simply says, pray without 
ceasing. Then we turn to Ephesians. 6th chapter, 18th verse. He gives another instruction. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching, there's, there's that watching again. Thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now our next point for the purpose of prayer is to be strengthened. Has anyone ever been in a state of weakness? Where you just didn't feel like living. You might not have told anybody. But you just didn't feel like living anymore. You was like, just take me out of here. And you went and took one Benadryl and thought it was going to take you out. <laughs> Second Kings, 6th chapter. And the 16th verse. And he answered, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Yahuwah, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord of Yahuwah opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and beheld the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So prayer can strengthen someone's eyes that they can see a whole different dimension. Because how you look at a thing is going to be how a thing affects you. If you got a positive outlook, positive things will come. But if you always negative, he talking about me, she talking about, oh, they out to get me. Then guess what? People are always going to be out to get you. Or oh, that's what it's going to seem like. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So you watch the, watch the lives of people that have a, a positive outlook and are connected into the Father's energy. No matter what goes wrong in their life, they always find the good in it. Why, he, why did this happen? He allowed it to happen for your good. It's always a good reflection. And, and that's what Shaul said, for we know that all things work together for the good. Of them that love Elohim, the called according to his purpose. So nothing happens by chance. Nothing by chance. It's all being acted out. Now the question is, which side are your thoughts on? Are you going to let the enemy use your thoughts? Or are you going to let the Father use your thoughts? Because if a person keeps saying, it's the Father, it's going to get better. Guess what? It get better. Get, better. get better. But I've seen it. I've seen it happen time and time again. Man, I don't know what's going on. It's just getting worse. Guess what happened? It gets worse. It gets worse. The power of life and death are in the tongue. Now when it says tongue, it's talking about what you speak. What you say. So, you can actually pray for someone strengthening. And, if, and they can be strengthened. And that's what we need to do in church. We need to start targeting, almost like a military strategist, targeting people that need to be strengthened. And send prayers in their direction. So it's going to do one of two things. It's going to strengthen them. Or it's going to tighten up. Sometimes he'll make things worse for he make it better so that you can learn a lesson. Especially if you're hard-headed. You got any hard-headed folks in here? See, the, you, you find it in families. 
there was a kid, you didn't have, you just look at him. He straightened up. Then there was some, you, had, you beat them, you talked to them, you beat them, you talked to them. You, and if you didn't continually do that, then the, they would just be sucked up in the world system. So when you don't learn the lesson, guess what he does? He takes you through a cycle. Look at the children of Israel. They wandered in the wilderness 40 years. <laughs> For a four-day journey, someone said. But he takes you through that same. If you don't learn the lesson, you go through a financial irresponsibility. We use that one. You don't know how to spend your money. You don't know how to give. So your money just seemed to float away in the air. I thought I had $50. Where did the dollar come from? Money just disappearing. But when you learn to be a good steward over what he gives you. And this is about strengthening now. Because it takes strength to be a good steward. Because you got everything in you telling you to do otherwise. If you got $50 you know you need to go pay grocery. Buy grocery with. Oh man, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna buy me a couple of tickets. Oh, I'm gonna just buy all tickets. And now you coming to us saying you hungry. I might have to turn you away, I'm sorry. Because it's a, you, you had the opportunity to be a good steward. But because of choice, you made, a, you made bad choice. So now maybe the hunger or cause you to walk the way you're supposed to walk and be a good steward. Mm -hmm. Hunger can do some things to you. <laughs> now here's a good one. Healing. One of the purposes is healing. Let's go to James, the fifth chapter. The Yaakov. And the fifth verse. Excuse me, in the 16th verse. He says here, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Then right after the healing, it talks about the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous avails much. Now I want you to think about this. How effective can you be on your job when you're hurt? Whether it's you got a cold, you got a migraine, your back hurts, whatever it may be. How effective can you be? You can't be effective because it's distracting your mind from your task. Every time you reach to get, oh, there's that reminder, that pain. But when you're healed, all your mental effort can go towards the task at hand. And this is what James is saying. He said, Be, get yourself in a healed state. Healed from your past. Healed from people that have hurt you. So that your prayers can be effective. That's what we want. We have too many people in church sometimes that are hurt. And in their hurt state, they're trying to do things. And what they're doing, they're causing more chaos than helping. So sometimes you have to take a back seat and get yourself straight, get healed, get re revived, regenerated. Anybody ever took a day off for yourself, slept in late? That's 6 o'clock for some of us. <laughs> Slept in late, got a sufficient. We let, we let our bodies get the rest it needed. Then when you got up, you ate a nice breakfast. Then you felt revived, didn't you? I've had some days like, ooh, I wish I could have slept in this morning. <laughs> 
but duty calls. I get it Monday. So make sure you, you are not only looking at your healing, but look out for others too. Because the scripture said here that we'll confess our faults one to another. Pray. Not talk about, but pray. Somebody tell you something, confide in you. Your duty is to pray for that person. One for another that you may be healed. Then it goes on the fervent, effectual prayer of what kind of man? Of a righteous man. Of a righteous man. Not, not didn't just say a man. A righteous man. But a righteous man according to the scripture. Availeth much. Then he, they give the story of uh, Elijah. How he prayed and the heavens shut up and didn't rain for the space of, uh, I believe it was three and a half years. So, prayer is a powerful thing. Now, let's talk just briefly. Just as sure as you can pray for the right purpose, you can pray with the wrong purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we hear it on TV. We hear it in our churches um, where people are praying for the wrong reason. Let's go to Matthew. You got to love Matthew. Matthew Yahoo, you got to love him. He just laid it out there for you mm -hmm. in his teachings. Sixth chapter, the fifth verse. And it goes, and when thou prayest, thou shall not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the street, excuse me, in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So, one wrong purpose is praying to be seen. So, you want to make sure that you're not just want to be in the limelight, you know. If I pray this prayer right, I can get on TBN. <laughs> I can get on the Word Network. So you got to make sure that you have the right purpose in your prayer. Then he goes on. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Then he gives another instruction on wrong praying. But and it's in the seventh verse. But when ye pray, use not vain repetition as the heathens do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So praying eloquent words is not the key. You know, you go to some churches, you hear, you hear them play, you know, oh, illustrious father. You know, they sound like they're getting all deep. Look like somebody opened up the dictionary and poured the dictionary on them. But see, what makes your prayer so powerful is the words you're praying, you're living. That's the power of prayer right there. What you're praying, you're living. Man. And just had a just a moment there. Mm -hmm. But that is what makes the difference in your prayer life. You know, because some people can are praying mentally. You know, you can do a mental prayer, you can rehearse it, you repeat it, and you can know it by heart. But when you pray what's in your heart, and when I say what's in your heart, your sincere words. He wants you. He don't want made up words of somebody else. That's why I get tired of, you know, you go to churches and everybody in the church pray the same way. No personalities in the prayer. No you in the prayer. 
You heard it? And it, it well, it's aggravating, but we got to learn. We got to learn. But we're doing well, I think. Wouldn't you say so? Yes. I think we're doing well. Let's go to Psalm 66. We're still on praying with the wrong purpose. Psalm 66. And we read this before, but I just want to reiterate this once again. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord of Yahoo would not hear me. But verily, Elohim has heard me and has attended to the voice of my prayer. So there again, I'm living. Yes, ma'am. It's Psalm 66 and verse 18. All right, let's shift gears just a little bit. Somebody said we get ready to put it in second. We got some race car drivers in here. Yeah. Hebrews, very familiar passage, 11th chapter and 6th verse. Hebrews, the 11th chapter and the 6th verse. And it goes like this. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to Elohim, or God, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So it's not just a one-time seeking you found, but it's a continual, it's a cycle. You're looking for him in every area of your life. Not just when I come to church on Sunday or when I'm in a, a class on Saturdays. But in every area of your life, you're seeking him. You're seeking him in what you wear. You're seeking him in what you eat. You're seeking him in where you work. Man, the, the father blessed me. I got $300 in tips at the strip club. <laughs> See, y'all didn't know what I would, you're seeking him in the area of where you work. Because everything doesn't bring glory to his name or esteem to his name. So you're seeking him in every area, not just in the areas you want to. See, and that's what a lot of people want to do. They want to seek the Father where they want to. Well, I, I hate my brother. And I have an art against my sister. You're supposed to seek him in that area. You can't leave no stones unturned. He affects every area of your life. He defect, affects every decision that you make. You don't make a decision without him or consulting him or going by his word or his standard. Even the person that you marry, you should have consulted him about. Father, is this the one? Or is this a wolf in sheep clothing? Mm -hmm. How many had a wolf? Don't, 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 don't raise your hand. <laughs> I'm glad y'all can laugh today. Now, let's go to James. Somebody still thinking about that wolf. <laughs> First chapter. And the sixth verse. It's talking about this faith thing. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth. Is like a wave. Of the sea. Driven. With the wind. And tossed. Now, has anyone ever been out on the ocean? Or been, been it, uh, I know you have, Romeo. Or been, um, or been at the beach. Or even at a pond or a lake. 
you would notice what dictates the waves that come in. It's the wind. And I don't, maybe you've been at a storm. I've seen storms where look, you couldn't figure out which way the wind was blowing because you had crosswinds. Now imagine yourself wavering with the Father and saying, you just like that way. You cannot go with the wave of people's opinions. What somebody has said about you matters not if you're getting your life in order. If you're trying to get in line with the Father's word, it matters not. Your past is a wave gone by. Right. 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 So don't let your past waves and winds dictate where you're going now. Amen. Because you're in a whole different place. You got a whole different source. Those old winds might try to blow, but they can't dictate where you're going. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Only if you let them. Talking about faith. See, your, your faith and what people do. Now, we talked about the mind. I hope that looks like a good brain. <laughs> All right, y'all stop talking about my own. <laughs> and, and man should not live by bread alone. <laughs> well, what, what, whatever. We, we know what it is. Now, it talked about a man being unstable in his, all his ways. He's divided. Now, here, your, your brain connects because you know there are different functions on the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain. But they work together. But you have some people where it's disconnected. There's no connection between the lobes. So basically, how it's going to work for us, we can apply this a couple of different ways. Your life that you're living and your prayer life are connected. So you can't ask him something if you're wavering in how you live and expect him over here to answer it. There's not, that's no match. There is, that's not. Because faith, as we're going to find out, is connected to how you live. So when Abraham, our father Abraham, when he came out from among the heathens that he was among, the father said, come out from among them. And he walked out. He obeyed, he didn't, you know, he obeyed what the father told him. He didn't stay an extra month or wait around trying to see who's going to go with him. He made a decisive decision. I'm coming out. He told me to come out. And see, that's what some of us need to do to really uh, shake up our life. He done spoke some things to us. We need to just do it. Don't procrastinate. Because guess what? When, you, when he tells you to do something, you wait around, you wavering. You wavering. And that's the hard, and, and that's at all levels. I could give you more on that, but we're going to stop right there on that one. It's, don't worry, more coming. <laughs> okay, now let's go to James, second chapter. And, and do, you, do you see what happens when, even though we've had this session more than one time, when we continually teach on something, 
Every lesson you get more, even though it's the same material. That is just a um, that is just a co confirmation that the Father works in cycles. If we keep going in the cycle, we learn more instead of just pass it one time. Let's see, James, second chapter, 17th verse. Even so faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. So the equation that we came up with, faith minus works equals death. That's the equation. Okay, yea, yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. If thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devil, or Hasatan, also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now listen to what it's saying. When he offered Isaac or Yitshak, his son upon the altar, seeth thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed Elohim, or God, and was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of Elohim. So, now, here we have, let, let's just look at that now, because we, we're talking about faith and believing. The father had given Abraham a promise. He said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Okay. And here it is, his son of promise. Listen to the word, his son of promise. Not his son of the flesh, but his son of promise. Isaac or Yitshak. The father said, I want you to offer up your only son. Now, how he going? Now, he could have sit up there questioning how in the world is he going to make me the father of many nations? And he going to take the only son I got? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the question. Mm -hmm. There was no question. There was only obedience. That's right. He took his son. So he took his son. Gathered up. He gathered up wood. And he went. And the father showed him the place. Mm -hmm. And when he had laid his son on the altar and was mm -hmm. getting ready to slay him. That proved to him that he loved the father more than he loved his son. That's what he wanted. He wanted to see that. The father wanted to see that love. Because Abraham, I firmly believe that Abraham did the belief. Well, if he gave me this son, he can give me another one. So his faith was proved. By his works. Mm -hmm. So faith plus works, plus works equals, life. equals life. Girl, you got that down, don't you? Glory to God. <laughs> so this right here becomes the key component. Your works. How you living? How you living will validate that. So if you living crazy... You lying, mm. doing all kind of stuff you ain't supposed to, treating your neighbors bad, mm. talking about folks in the church. Mm. Yeah. What's that telling me about your faith? Your faith is corrupted. Don't think you're going to get over here to life or even life more abundant. Yeah. And this is not working. It won't work. He's not a liar. His word is proven. 
Man, I like that formula. Thank you, Father. We got one more. Uh, James, third chapter. Eighth verse. We still, third chapter, eighth verse of James. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith, bless we, Elohim of God, even the Father, and therewith curse we man, which is made after the similitude of God, or Elohim. Out of the mouth proceedeth cursings and blessings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does a fountain send forth the same place, sweet water and bitter water? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive uh, berries or even the olive figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. So what he's saying, basically I want you to remember that there are two seeds. This one was the seed of promise. And this was the enemy. It's only two seeds in the world. This seed right here can't produce this seed. So what he's saying, if you're of the promise, then everything's going to line up. How you live, what you say, what you speak. Because we know that this right here comes down to what you say and what you do. That's your fruits. And it reproduces. That's, that's the law that he established in the books. It reproduces after its own kind. So a good tree will bring forth good fruit. An evil tree can only bring forth evil fruit. So you got to make sure that your fruit, the fruit now, because how's the tree work? You, you got the tree, it's got the roots, I mean roots everywhere. Then you got the rest of the tree up here. And the tree brings forth, well guess what? It, it brings forth what it's connected to. Because before you have, before you have roots, you got a what? A seed. Remember, everything comes from seeds. That's why you have to be careful what type of seeds or seed you allow to be planted in your children's life when they're growing up. Some of them struggle right now because of the seed that was planted. And it could have been, could have been a homosexual seed. Right. Right. You got to watch relatives. Right. The teachers, you got to watch. The you you got to watch. You'd be surprised. Right. So even now, why we want to, uh, at least for the first year, we're not going to have a lot of speakers in here. Because I have to watch the seed that comes in here. Because everything comes from the seed. You can find that in Genesis, the first chapter. The whole first chapter. Oh, let's go to Genesis. Bereshit means beginning. That's what Genesis is. Fifth chapter. I mean, 26th chapter, excuse me. And the fifth verse. Now, we want to establish before that Abraham came before the giving of the Torah or the instructions at Mount Sinai. And what this proves right here is that the father from the beginning gave the instructions. And it says in the fifth verse, 
because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, and my statutes, and my laws. So it was nothing, it didn't just happen at Mount Sinai. It happened way before, it happened from the beginning. He gave, he gave them to Adam and Eve. And we have evidence because he told them, of every tree in this garden you can eat of, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of that tree. Because in the day you do, you will die. And what did they do? They broke that instruction. Very simple instruction. Now we shift gears a little bit. We're going to get into more of the um, inner workings of prayer. Prayer starts with who? With you. With you. Just regular, just regular prayer. You know, you in your prayer life. It starts with you. It starts with you. You're just going through, you know, your people to pray. Pray. You're mentally thinking of things you need to pray for. But there's a, another. It's called intercession. And my writing still hasn't gotten better. But it will. That starts with the Father. It starts with him, and it ends with him. Now, what's the bridge? You. You are the bridge. So he might put someone on your heart. Let's say he, he might, put, he might um, put sister love on your heart. And you wonder, now why am I? Why she didn't do and you pray for. Then later on you find out she was going through some things. And Father helped, guided her through. And he put you there to help shine light. Your prayer. Now, how many of us have been guilty? He put someone in our heart and we didn't pray for him. We've been guilty. We've all, I've done it too. But my task now recognize. is to recognize and to pray. Even, even, and the good practice would be because you don't have to pray. Um, you don't have to be in a certain position to pray. You don't have to be on your knees. You don't have to. You can be walking, standing, sitting. Okay, because this is just a vessel. We have all types of examples. Don't have to have your eyes closed. Most people close their eyes so they can concentrate because they're easily distracted. So you can, you can pray with your eyes open. But if you notice you're getting distracted, then, you know, now don't, don't be in your car. Oh, I'm going to pray and you closing your eyes. Now, come on. <laughs> you got to use a little wisdom. You know, pull the car to the side of the road. <laughs> If you, if you just have to close your eyes, pull the car to the side of the road, and pray. Or if you're walking, don't just close your eyes, you know, go somewhere, stand to the side. But, but I'm telling you, you have to develop. All, you you got to be open. Because you never know. There, there might be a time you have to pray, and you can't close your eyes. So don't get so caught up. I got to close my eyes. So, <laughs> yeah, don't get so caught up that you that you just think you got to do it. But what you want to be able to do is when he puts someone on your mind, especially in intercession, do it right then. Don't wait. Do it. Do it right. Right at that moment, he gives it to you because. Usually, if we wait, we're going to do this. Then a couple of days later, oh, I forgot. I should have prayed for this. So do it right there. 
at the time of conception. That he puts it in your spirit. Do it right then. And remember, it's not how many words you speak. Remember he said he's not going to hear you for your much speaking. But it's going to be your sincerity and your relationship. So it could be a quick, Father, whatever they're going through, help them right now. Send help, Father. Bless them. I speak peace into the life. And you finish. It ain't take 10 seconds. Then if he puts it there again later on, pray for him again. And just continue on the cycle until he releases you from that person. Then when he releases you, you don't have to you know, go back there. So do it right then. Yes, ma'am. It does. But I'm a, I'm, we're going to get here in a short spell. We're going to open up that continue, um, pray without ceasing. A little, we're going to expand on it and give it a Hebrew thought. Okay, how many of you all used to fight while you were in school? Anybody fight? <laughs> how many of y'all still fight? <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad the honest ones did raise their hand. You talking about physical fight, right? Uh, yeah, some of us still physically. Some of us fight with words. See, that's why I want to Yeah. Physical fight. So, but. I was a diplomat. I tried to have peace with everybody. <laughs> Turn. Turn to Ephesians, sixth chapter. So we're talking about warfare. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 12th verse. So we're going to harness the power of that fight that's in you. And we're going to incorporate it in church. So you can fight some demons. That was in high school, that's down. Well, you need to get some of it back when we get ready to fight. We're going to rage war against the enemy. Okay, 6th chapter, 12th verse. And it says, Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against world rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness, in the heavenlies. Okay, now I'm gonna read you King James Version. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we know it's not this. This is flesh and blood. So we we're not supposed to be fighting each other. Or wrestle. When you think of wrestling, you know you think of getting somebody on the ground, getting them in a, a lock hole where they can't get out. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So prayer acts as a weapon in your arsenal. Because if you jump down to the 18th verse of that same chapter, it talked about us praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So, now, when you pray, I'm going to give you this good suggestion. Go back and look over some of the Psalms. Because you have some excellent Psalms that have prayer in them. You can tell that the psalmist was praying. And, and it's an excellent tool to draw from. Because when you pray, you want to Pray according to the word. Pray according to his word. Pray according. Now, what do you mean? Pray according to his word. Well, you have to know how the word applies in your situation. What you're going through. Some things you will not pray yourself out of. Amen. Because it's meant for you to go through it. Mm -hmm. 
So your prayer should be a prayer of navigation, a prayer of direction to show me how to order my steps. How do I walk through my situation? What I'm going through. How do I navigate through what I'm going through right now? Because how many people have prayed, Father, remove this person out of my life. Get rid of them, Father. I don't care how you do. Please do it. Remember when the Mashiach or the Savior or Messiah prayed? He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass. But nevertheless, okay, so if the cup is not meant to pass, then give me the strength to endure it. Sometimes there's more strength in enduring and going through a thing than just letting it pass. Some of us wouldn't be where we are right now if he hadn't let us go through some things. So when you're praying according to the word, you got to see where he's taking you. Remember what? And pray. How many of us walk without looking? If we didn't, we bump into all kind of stuff. We got to open our spiritual eyes and see where he's trying to take us. And then have a willing spirit to go there. Because who wants heartache? Who wants trials? Or trip? Who wants that stuff? Is anybody? None of us. But it comes to perfect you. So in your prayer, when things start happening, one good question to always ask is, Father, what are you trying to teach me? Or what are you trying to show me? Because we might be praying away, trying to pray away something he's trying to bless us with. And do all things without murmuring and complain. So if you got to go through, go through with joy, a happiness, knowing that he's perfecting you. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. We got some pretty, I think y'all are pretty open. Uh, most of y'all have been here before, right? Have you, have you been to the class before? Yes. Okay. So, and, and this becomes a challenge because some things are so ingrained in us that we're not willing to embrace what he's saying. Okay. The Father gives us in Teach Me How to Pray, Luke, the 11th chapter, and the first verse, where the disciples Acts specifically teach us how to pray. And guess what he did? He gave them a model prayer. He didn't say pray this. Because remember, things can become vain repetition when you take them and just repeat them over and over and over and over again and it loses meaning to you. So, He's saying pattern after this. And his first words were, Our Father. Our Father. Now notice what he says. He doesn't say, say, our God. Or our Lord. Now did he? No. he? Did he? Please help me out now. No. He said our Father. And someone said it's an intimate relationship. Because if he's the Father, what are you? Child. You the children. Y'all the children. It's the old folks. Y'all the chaps. I know. See, I'm from the country. <laughs> so, he, here's the challenge. I mean, you, you hear, this is so widely used 
that it violates the instruction that he gave us. You'll hear people say this and this before you hear them say that. Now, I challenge you. I want you to do some research. Go back. Get an English, get some, and you're going to have to really dig because you'll find out that in the etymology of words, that a lot of words come to a dead end, but they had to come from somewhere. And a lot of times when words come to a dead end, it's because they don't want you to know where it came from. Who is they? The man. Not man. Oh, Hasatan. Satan. He don't, want, he don't want you to know. Because Isaiah said, the father declared the end out of the beginning. So if you can find out where a word came from the beginning, then you gotta, you know something then. So Go back, research the word God. Okay? Now, ask yourself. This is an English word. The Hebrew word is Elohim. Okay? Now, ask yourself. Well, we know where that came from. Well, I, I'll teach that later, but... God, where did it come from? When, when you go back, most of our words, some of them came from Hebrew and filtered through the Greek and through Latin, then got to English. But this particular word, God, you can't find out, or at least in the etymology of words, they don't really want to tell you. But it came from a word called Gad. G-A-D. And that word is actually the name of a Greek god. But you're going to have to go back and dig a little bit to find it because it's not real. You're not going to get your modern day encyclopedia or dictionary and find it. So you got to got to you got to kind of you got to find a dictionary that deals on the etymology or the origin of words. Okay. Now, this word Lord, where did that come from? Ask yourself. Go back and research it. Now, let's go back to God. Now, if something is called a God, what can you call your God? A car. A car. Could be Buddha. Right. Confucius. Right. It could be a, a number of different things. So, my question is, do I want to classify my father in the same class as all those. No. 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 You, you with me? Mm -hmm. You sure? I'm with you. Okay. I just want to make sure. Because he's a father. Now, notice if you go back and research religion, how many religions call their deity father? No. I'm Anybody find any? No. They don't call him father. God. They'll call him God. God right. And some of them might even call him Lord. Right. But they never call him Father. So when you say our Father, you're saying, you, you, you're categorizing him all by himself. Mm -hmm. Didn't he say, I am, well, in the original text, he said, uh, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. There is no Elohim besides me. Or he said, there is no God. Uh, if you were to put it in how the King James quoted. But there's none else. But so I am the one. No one before me, no one after. I'm the first and last, the Alpha Omega, the Olive Tower. That's the category you're putting him in. We don't have a generic father. He's not generic. Now, the word Lord. We, I'm going to show you some things on Lord this morning. Now, notice he says, um, Our Father, who art in heaven, how be thy name, or set apart is thy name. So his name is not like any other name. But what you will notice, we talked about Baal, we talked about 
Um, we can talk about Buddha. All there. So-called God's got names. Why well, I always don't have one. Because he is. But he still got a name. He still got a name. And what has happened, the way you destroy a people or turn a people away from him is through language. The word gay. What does it mean today? Homosexual. What did it mean that? What did it mean forty years ago? Happy, man. Happy. Happy. You happy? You gay, brother? <laughs> see, <laughs> see, you see what I'm saying? See, they changed the meaning of words. It's something. It is a monster, really. In the, in the English language, we focus on nouns. People, places, things. Hebrew focuses on the verb. We want to know the action. The action, the nouns are actually in Hebrew, the nouns come from verbs. See how we've twisted it? English, we go from what? Read from what? Left to right. Hebrew, right. To the left. So, look, now how, who in the world sat down? Huh, I'm going to change this. But isn't that how your brain is right there? I'm going to have to research that. I'm thinking it is. Your brain is right to left. So, if you think about it, we reverse the order of our. And what, is, what does the enemy do? He twists twist things. things <laughs> think about it. If you. If you twist something, and we were going from left, I mean from right, I mean, yeah, right to left, and you twist it, now what happens? You going from, he just, he switch it around on us. Huh? You pray for me, bro. The fact that the Hebrews focus in on action. Which represents living it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the English, we focus on things. You know, nouns represent person. But mm -hmm. you said that. So our focus is off. Our focus, focus is on actually living it. God. Yeah. Right. He Instead switched of, us. Don't worry about what, what we doing for right. God. Right. Don't worry about what people say about you or what, mm -hmm. you know. The wow. I'm telling you, it's some more. It's more stuff. Now I'm getting ready to show you some more stuff here. I got with me, and, and I recommend. I'm putting it in the camera. I, you don't have to focus in, brother, but get one of these. This is a start. This is a good start, and you want to get this particular version because it has an expanded. This is a strong concordance word study. It, and it's a good book, but. Over 7,000 times in this here, or in the Hebrew text, you're going to find, and this is the English representation, these initials, Y-H-W-H, which is an actual name. It's not Lord. Lord is a translation. It's not even a transliteration. Transliteration means you try to keep the sound. They didn't even do that. They gave it a whole different thing. So what do you think King James meant when he said when they said in the year? What was King James considered? A king. A lord. Yeah. Yeah, that's a type. So when they say in the year of our Lord, they were talking about who was ever king at that time. When, it, when, uh, when things were being written. We're not going to go in depth because most of you have seen and know. Um, we'll do this at, that'll be another session because we really need to uh, understand. But what I want to show you, if you go and look this up, I'm going to give you the numbers so you can do it. I want you to look up a particular name at your leisure. And you can even um, come look in mine if you want to, but you can't take it with you. 
<laughs> you got to buy your own. You got to buy your own. Invest in your knowledge. They say if you want to hide something, put it in a book. Okay, if you go, there's a, a word, particular word I want you to look up. And I'm going to probably have to flip this over in a little bit. It's called Baal. B-A-A-L. Okay, and the Hebrew number, I'm going to give you two of them, is H-1168. And H one one six seven. It's powerful stuff, bro. Now, before I give you what it says in here, I want to read you a read you a scripture. Okay, I want you. I want to read the scripture to you. Go to Judges. Second chapter. Hallelujah. Thirteenth verse. Well, let's do the um, let's do the um, eleventh. Start the eleventh verse. Second chapter, eleventh verse. Some good stuff here. Okay, and it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of Yahuwah the Lord and served Balaam. They forsook the Lord God, or Yahuwah Elohim, of their fathers, and brought them out of the land, that brought them out of the land of Egypt, followed other gods, and of gods, and the gods of people that round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked Yahuwah or the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord of Yahuwah and served Balaam and Ashtaroth. Okay. Now, go over to Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Yeah, there's some new information, but I thought it was important. So I added it in. Jeremiah 23rd. 23rd chapter. In the 13th verse. And it goes, And I have seen Frawley in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesy in Balaam and cause my people to err. To err. Okay. Now there's one, there's one other verse. Here, that's really going to um, let me go back here to our trusted concordance. This is studying on this, not on the spot, but just good stuff. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, now let's look at the 27th verse of the same chapter. Okay, and he goes, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams. He's talking about the prophets now. This is what the prophets are doing. By the dreams which they tell every man in his neighborhood, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Balaam. Okay, you, you follow that. He caused them to forget the father's name, and they forgot his name for who? Baal. For Baal. Okay. Now, Hebrew number. We're going to, I'm going to go back here and look up the Hebrew 11, 67, and 8. Because the Hebrew um, number 6, 166. Excuse me, 1168 comes from 1167. 
So I'm going to look up 1167 and read you a couple of things here. Now, let's look here. It says um, Balaam. Baal, excuse me, thank you. 1166, it means master, hence a husband, or figurative owner, often used of another now in modification of this latter sense. Then he goes, then when you go on down, a masculine singular now meaning Lord. Ooh. Husband, owner, possessor, Ooh. title of a Canaanite deity. Baal. Now, I asked you, listen to what it said. One of the definitions that it, it said that it means is Lord, husband, owner, possessor. They forgot the father's name for what? And started using Baal. And one of the meanings is what? Lord. Don't want to pray, uh, Lord. I, I, is, it, is it clicking? Yeah, so we don't want to pray, Lord. No, and is it clicking? Is it, yes. you, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, you can't readily see this. Now, am I going to condemn someone that uses this and this is all they know? No. 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 My job is to teach you so that you can learn to use this. But the connection here is so readily seen. Jeremiah 23, 27, say they forgot the father's name. The enemy has always wanted to destroy his name. If you talk to the Jewish people, the Jewish people say his name can't be pronounced. We lost it. But I've shown you that it can be pronounced. And then when you go here and you look up Baal, and it tells you one of the meanings of Baal is Lord, husband, master, owner, possessor. Now, when has my father ever called himself that he's my possessor or my owner? Or my husband. He's my father. So, powerful stuff. I'm telling you, this right here will help. And we're going to be doing some other studies. Now, some not going to believe it. But because some don't believe it, and the Father planted a good seed in you, don't deny it. Don't, don't go along. Just together. Because right. don't go along. if you have truth, and you don't follow truth, you're going to be held accountable. That's right. Walking in sin. Right. This some power. This is deep. You heard this some powerful stuff. I know you're gonna go back and look. I want you to go back and look. <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Do your research. This is what this is for. To challenge your minds to dig deeper and to look for this stuff. Okay, now he talks about honoring his name, then he goes on. Acknowledge his kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. We're going we're gonna to do the flip on y'all today. Just hope it don't flip on me. <laughs> y'all don't need no good laughs. <laughs> Not at my expense. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> he said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Now, here we have earth, here we have heaven, heaven, earth. So, where did Moses or Moshe get the pattern for all the stuff that he built? From the Father. From the father. From the father. From the father. He saw a pattern in heaven, didn't he? Yeah. So, all the tabernacle and all that stuff he got from the pattern he saw in heaven. And then he did what? He, he built it here on earth, right? Exact replicas. Mm -hmm. So everything in, up here in this realm is already mapped out. 
is perfect. So he said, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we should be praying that the, the will of or the pattern of heaven be here on earth. Now, what is earth? I mean, what is heaven? What does the scripture say heaven is? His throne. And what is earth? His foot. Now think about that. Heaven is his throne. And earth is his footstool. What do you do with a footstool? You rest on it. So we should be since we're the footstool, we actually should be resting his will. We should be resting his will, his footstool. Because when you think about feet, you think about feet as a that's walk it out. And why does the scripture talk about his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path? So we we have some very, very powerful stuff. Acknowledge his will. Because we want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, here comes a, one that's really tough for us. Give us our daily bread. <laughs> Give us our substance for the... How many days can you live? One. Can anybody go, shoot forward to tomorrow? I heard you got a device at home, Romeo? You, you can dial it for tomorrow? So it's daily. So what are you creating for yourself if you're going way one year away? Problems. Is anything promised over here no. for tomorrow? So what the Father want us to do is live daily. Okay, when he talks about living, living daily, he wants to, there's a cycle he's created for us to live by. Because we know if we walk in this cycle, that every day is going to be provided for. Just like he did for the children of Israel in the wilderness. In the morning time, they got up, they picked the manna. He gave them certain instructions. On the sixth day, they picked what? Double. So that on the seventh day, they didn't have to work. They could rest. Regenerate. Oh, yeah. We, it's always a greedy one among you. Okay, now forgive us our sins. Let us lay aside the weights and the sins that so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. So when, when you are carrying sin, you're actually weighting yourself down. But how do you release sin? If it involves another person, you have to recon be reconciled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Remember he talked about if you bring your gift to the altar. Mm -hmm. You remember your brother has an altar. Get not you got an altar against your brother. But your brother got an altar against you. Mm -hmm. Leave your gift at the altar. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come back and give your gift. Mm -hmm. Do we always follow those principles? Nope. No. We don't. Some of us are, are doing do a good job. You know, you, do you have something against me? Or is some, did I do something wrong? Did I offend you?
But most of the time, we just let it ride, don't we? So we oh. let it ride. Basically, we, it's, a, it's a great hindrance to our prayer life. Yes? I have a question. I know I had a situation where, you know, I felt that I had did something to someone only because, I, I mean, I kept praying about it and trying to figure out in my mind, you know, what did I do to that person? But because they were acting different towards me, mm -hmm. I felt that I did something wrong. So I went to that person and I said, you know, have I done anything, you know, to offend you or to hurt you or or anything? Because I just feel in my spirit that, you know, you're treating me differently. Mm -hmm. And they was like, no, you ain't did nothing to me. Oh, no, you ain't. And so... And I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? It was on my job. And so they kept saying, no, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. But I still felt, and so I was like, okay. But I still could feel that that person was treating me differently. So what do you do about that situation? I mean, I just kept praying on and praying mm -hmm. on. And eventually, she started acting like she used to towards me. But for like a while, she was treating me real differently. And I couldn't figure out in my mind anything that I had said or did that will make her act like that. So what do you do in a situation like that? You release yourself. Mm -hmm. By going to that person, she actually you release yourself. Okay. Now, if that person still wants to hold themselves in bondage by not admitting, right. you, you went, do you tried to reconcile. You can't do anything about that. Okay. So you did what you were supposed to do okay. to release yourself. Because remember, in most situations, mostly all of them, What's the only factor you really can control? You. 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 Can you make somebody forgive you? No. But no. you can ask. Right. And if they don't want to forgive you, that's on them. You did what you were supposed to do. Okay. See, get yourself released. Okay, I can't control what the other person want to do. That's them. But I can control me. Sometimes, most of the time. So now we're going to um, kind of get into a little different part because I want you to see there's some powerful stuff. I want to show you the cycles of the Father in prayer. This will revolutionize revolutionize your prayer life, especially if you follow it. Okay, let's go to Exodus. The 30th chapter. And the first verse. Okay, and thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood, shalt thou make it. Then let's look at the sixth verse, six, seven, and eighth. And thou shalt put it before the, the vow that is by the ark, excuse me, the veil by the ark of testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet thee and Aaron shall burn there on sweet incense every what? Morning. Morning. And that time was usually, that time was nine o'clock. When he dresseth the lamp, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamp at evening, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before Yahuwah the Lord throughout your generation. So he gave specific he gave specific times when incense were supposed to be burned at the altar. And it was Aaron's responsibility at that time. Um to light the menorah, to burn incense every morning and every e evening. What's the, what's the menorah? It's the, the, candle. 
The, it's the candle holder or the candle with seven branches, we'll say. Okay, now let's go. Because remember, it burned it in the morning and the evening. Now let's go to Psalms. And what he was burning was incense, correct? Psalms 141. In the second verse. And notice the association here. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. And the lifting up of my hands as the morning sacri evening sacrifice. So there's association there between the burning of incense and prayer. Can you see it? Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Now, let's go over to Revelations. The fifth chapter. And the eighth verse. Everybody good? Okay, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odor, which are the what prayers of the saints. Interesting. Now let's jump over to Revelations. The eighth chapter. And third. Third eighth chapter, third and fourth verse. Now listen to the language. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden sceptre. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Listen. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended before Elohim out of the angel's hand. Isn't it, now you see that association? That was uh, Revelations 8 chapter 3rd and 4th verse. So to get a picture of this, that's why we went back to Exodus. The priests were commanded to light the incense in the morning and the evening. And we've read that the incense was associated with prayer, the prayer of saints. We saw that in Psalms 141 and 2. So what happens after the, the uh, discontinuation of the temple sacrifices, prayer, prayer was accomplished, uh, placed in those places. But my contention is, I think that those were prayer times anyway that he designated. Because you see it all through the Psalms. And what you're going to see as we go forward that there was a morning prayer, there was a noon prayer, and there was an evening prayer. And it's readily identifiable in Scripture. Okay? And what we're going to do... Yeah, it's not quite as round, but it'll do. Okay, this is 9. This is 12. And this right here is... Three. 
let's put the 12 on the outside like the rest. Okay, so this is the third hour. This is the sixth hour. And this is the ninth hour. So the morning incense was here. And usually the evening was there. Okay, and we're going to see a pattern in scripture of people praying at those times. Let's go to Psalms, the fifth chapter. And what I'm suggesting, I'm not commanding, I don't have that authority. But what I'm suggesting is that we adopt during the day these times of prayer. Psalms, the fifth chapter, first verse. Give ear to my words, O Lord, O Yahuwah. Consider my meditation, hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my Elohim. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shall thy hear in the morning, O Lord, O Yahuwah. In the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee, and we'll look up. Okay, now let's go to Psalms 88 and 13. So what are we saying? What are we doing? Okay, notice. What is man, what is man basically done with our time? Changed our time, didn't he? Okay, when is our morning, what does the scripture say morning starts? Well, it's not a it's it's not a time. It's it's from sunset. Oh, in scripture, it's sunset. To sunset. Yeah, it's sunset now. Sunset to sunrise. We usually and now we say at twelve midnight. Isn't that how our time works? It's when the new day starts. But the new day starts with the Father at evening. And goes to the morning. We're going to see scripture that verifies that. So here again, we have another, another, another time when the, the enemy has changed the time. I'm going to have to research that one. So, so a lot of things have changed, but if we go back to scripture, the evening and the morning was the first day. That's in Genesis. The evening and the morning was the first day. So let's go to um, Psalms. We at Psalms 88, 13. It says, But unto thee have I cried, O Lord of Yahweh, and I, excuse me, and in the morning shall I Shall my prayer prevent thee? So there again, there's another instance where they prayed in the morning. Okay, let's, let's come over to our renewed covenant or our New Testament. Mark, first chapter. And the 35th verse. Okay, and it goes, in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary pray place and there prayed. So he prayed in the morning. Now the one that really is a, hits the nail on the head is Acts the second chapter. And we're talking about the morning prayer time. Acts the second chapter, first through the fourth verse. And here's another one of our feast. Feast of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house 
where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they all were filled with the Holy Ghost, or the Ruach HaKodesh, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Go to the 15th verse. Let's start at the 14th. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that are dwell at Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. What were they doing in the upper room? Praying. They were praying. Third hour of the day. So they was, he told them, we're not drunk. It's just nine in the morning. Nobody drinks that early unless you were drunkard. But then he went on and told them, well, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith Elohim, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So that's the third hour they were praying. So what are we saying? What are you saying? <coughs> What I'm saying is, when we start working on the Father's cycle, cycle you'll see, I'm telling you, you'll see some stuff happen. Because now, you're saying, okay, I'm acknowledging what's in heaven. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'm acknowledging your time and your schedule on earth. I'm sinking it. So when I sink it, and when I say sink, I'm unifying myself with it. I'm becoming what's in heaven. I'm becoming. I'm not becoming what's on earth. I'm becoming what's in heaven. So now my prayers become more effective. My prayers are answered. Because I'm doing what's in heaven. I'm doing what I see in heaven. I'm on heaven's time schedule. I'm not on earth time schedule. Father, I'm on your schedule now. And you, you start to see some manifestation of some things. Stop. Don't, don't take my word for it. I put the Duracell up here. I double dare you to do it. <laughs> Why do they call it the third hour, David? Because I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, this. If the day started in the evening. Well, see, you got two things working here. Right. Okay. okay. You got, you got. You got two things. Okay. This is when the days start. Okay. okay. Now, so here we're talking about a day schedule. Okay. Okay. The day starts in the in, in the evening uh -huh. and ends the following evening. But here we're talking about hours. Uh, okay. Because the temple function. He had them doing things at specific times. So here, we could say, is the bottom of the hour. It's not, this is not, it doesn't say the day starts there. Oh, okay. But that where, that's where the hours or the clock okay. ticks. All right, I'm gonna break this. Right, I got you. Okay. Right. Because what you got to remember now, according to where you are in the world, you're going to get a different view of sunrise and sunsets just because of the angle of the earth, the tilt of the axis. So, actually, I think how many hours is um, Jerusalem ahead of us? I think it's eight or twelve hours, something like that. I usually have it set on my clock so that I could, you know, know what time it is over there. But since we're in <laughs> Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get that one later. Because <laughs> we're not in, we might not be in physical slavery, but we're in economic slavery. Look at your phone bill. How many taxes you get on there? Huh? They tax the taxes, your gas. Then you're going to pay income tax, but that's another.
thing all together. Don't get me started. Now let's look at a noonday. The sixth hour. Let's go to Psalms 55. This is some good stuff. I tell you, you know, just going over and over again, it, it helped me so much, I tell you. Okay, Psalms 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my cry, my voice. He says, evening, morning, and noon. So there was, there was an acknowledgement here. So noon. But think about it now. Look how the enemy has worked. Because usually, usually it's the sun, you know, depending on the time of year, usually it rises around that time. But the enemy twisted it and, and got our day starting way up here instead of somewhere down here. Isn't that something? Do, 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 do. <laughs> it, must, it must be 12. That, see, she got her alarm. See, people got their alarms ringing because it's 12 noon and they want to pray. So that's a good thing. We will permit those. <laughs> I heard the Spirit say stop and pray Father right now we thank you we thank you for your time we acknowledge your prayer time of noon we ask you Father at this point that you empower those that are here empower their prayer lives take them to a new dimension let their spirits be receptive. Yes. Father, what I can't teach them, let your spirit yes. teach them yes, so that they might understand your way and your purpose. Yes. And I pray, Father, those that are under the sound of my voice, yes. open doors for them like never before. Yes. 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 Sow into them like never before. Let them feel your presence like yes. never before. Yes. Show forth your wonders yes. as we acknowledge your system. Yes, as the only system. Yes, Father. We acknowledge your way as the only yes, way. Father. And we thank you now. We bless you, Father. Thank you, Father. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I heard the same. Oh, Father. <laughs> yeah, I said it's time. I heard the same. We need to pray. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Father. And my, my phone is off, so that's thank why I was you, trying Father. to figure out how the alarm went off. Oh! Uh. Oh, <laughs> you. So how did phone phone go off? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it is off. Thank you, Father. It is off. A lot of work researching. I thought you had turned it off. I did. That's why I was here. Thank you, Father. Now let's go to our evening prayer. Let's go to our evening prayer. Matthew 14. <laughs> Matthew 14 and 23. Yes, Matthew 14 and 23. We're doing the evening prayer. And when he had sent forth the multitude, when, um, when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Okay, now we're going to Luke 6. Six and 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to Elohim. Then we're going to Mark 6, 47. And when he had sent them away, he departed.
departed into a mountain to pray. And, and when Eve was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. Now let's jump over to Acts 16. 16.25. Now here's a little different twist. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang songs unto Elohim. And the prisoners heard them. Now, let's run, we're going to run back over to Daniel. Because Daniel has some excellent examples. And remember, Daniel actually was in captivity. And what did they do in Babylon? They changed their names. They gave them different names. They tried to change their whole way of thinking, their culture. But Daniel's heart said that he wouldn't defile himself with the king's meat, nor the king's wine. So, in other words, what he was saying is, I'm going to keep the way that I know. The Hebraic way or Hebrew way. Okay, sixth chapter. In the 10th verse. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chambers towards Jerusalem. He knelt down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his Elohim as he did aforetime. So that, that's really saying before he was in captivity. That's what he did. He did the same thing in captivity. Okay, then the 11th verse. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his Elohim. Now, Daniel, the ninth chapter, in the 19th verse, is really going to nail this one down for us. It's going to have a couple of things in, in, um, in this one. Ninth chapter, 19th verse. It says, O Lord, O Yahuwah, hear, O Yahuwah, forgive O Lord, O Yahuwah, hearken and do, defer not for thy own sake, O my Elohim, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, why did they go into captivity? Because of sin. They took on the ways of the nations around them. You cannot worship him the way you want to worship him. You got to worship him the way he commanded. See, that's people get this thing. Well, you know, I can do it. No, you can't do it the way you want to. He laid it out. This is how I want you to worship me. Those are the instructions. Uh, let's see. And the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication before the Lord or Yahuwah my Elohim for the holy mountain of my Elohim. Yahweh was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening ovulation. Right there. That's some good stuff. Now let's um, go over to Ezra. That one's a little bit harder to find. In the King James, it's going to be beside. Um, there you go. Ezra 
Ezra ninth chapter. Starting at the fourth verse. Ninth chapter, fourth verse. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the voice of Elohim of Israel, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. Ooh. And I said, astonished until the evening sacrifice. Now, why were they carried away? Because of the transgressions. Okay. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness and having rent my garments and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto Yahuwah, my Elohim, and said, O oh, my Elohim, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to thee. My Elohim, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses, trespass is grown up unto the heavens. And he was praying. That was, that was like a prayer of forgiveness right there. But can, can you hear in that prayer his sincerity? He fell. Now notice the original word that we came was Paul. He fell down like falling down before the mighty king and beseeching him to answer his request. Sin will bring you down. That's what got that's what gets people in trouble. It's still the same cycle. Nothing new under the sun. That's right. Hallelujah. Let's go to First Kings eighteen. And the 36th verse. 1 Kings 18th chapter, 36th verse. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Yahuwah Elohim of Isaac, excuse me, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art. Elohim in Israel, and that all, excuse me, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Now, what was happening? This was the battle of Baal and the and the Elijah the prophet, where the prophets or the priest of Baal were had challenged and. Basically, what, what Elijah said, okay, this is what we're going to do. And this is going to prove who is the Elohim around here. Who's the Almighty? Who's the Most High? Who's the Everlasting? They had a sacrifice. He poured water on it. And the prophets of Baal called on their God from morning to evening. They started cutting themselves, thinking that that would... Cause the and Elijah was mocking. Where is your God? Where is he dead? Or maybe he's sleep. What's going on with him? Then his time comes, and notice when he comes is the evening sacrifice time, and he prays this prayer, and fire from our Elohim comes down and consumes. The sacrifice, uh -huh. and then licks the water up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I thought fire is supposed to put water out. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, water is supposed to put fire out. Got me going now. But he licked the water up, lapped it up. Man, you tip. And you, and you don't want to serve? Man, you got to be crazy. I ain't trying to serve him no other way than what he's commanding. Now, let's go to Luke. The 10th chapter. Mm -hmm. 
Here's that incense again. Luke the first, excuse me, the first chapter, 10th verse. I was ahead of myself, forgive me. First chapter and 10th verse. And the whole multitude of people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of Elohim standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And notice what the angel says. But the angel says unto him, Feel not, feel not Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. <laughs> so in performing his duty, he was in there praying. Talks about the incense, then the angel appeared, saying your prayer. I think I'm, I, I'm, we're getting ready to experience some angelic vi visitations mm -hmm. for people that, so prepare yourself, don't get scared. Mm -hmm. All <coughs> because some people going to be praying, not as the world prays, but we're going to be praying according to the Father's cycles. Don't get scared. It's, it's going to be something else. He's getting ready to use some people in here ministerial wise. He's getting ready to use people financially. So if money start to come your way, it's for the kingdom. Remember that. He'll allow you to enjoy, but the primary purpose is to establish his kingdom in the earth. And if you lose sight of that, easy come, easy go. easy go. Now, I could go through a whole bunch of other scriptures um, showing the prayer hours. But we, we, we kind of running a little bit behind schedule. So what we're going to do is just talk briefly about the different prayers. Prayer of thanksgiving and praise. Now, the prayer of thanksgiving, you're giving thanks. And in giving thanks, you want to posture yourself a certain way. Because it's one thing when a person says, thank you, you can hear in their voice whether they're thankful or not. You give me a book. Oh, thank you. You can hear it. Now, how much more can the Father hear what's in your heart mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you say thank you? Mm -hmm. Whether you're doing it out of form or fashion or whether there's a genuine thank you. So when you give me the book, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's, or you give me the book, thank you. <laughs> you snatching the book out of her hand. See, remember, Hebrew talks about action. I don't have it up there. Your actions speak louder than your words. So one of the biggest thank you, oh, I'm finished. <laughs> one of the biggest thank yous you can give is not always what you say, it's what you do. If you are thankful to the Father, then live like he told you to live. That's the greatest thank you can have for him ever. That's just like that person that I told you at work. Her actions showed me that I had did something to her, but her words were saying that I hadn't. See? Right. So her actions awesome. spoke louder than what she was saying to me. Mm-hmm. Powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So the prayer of thanksgiving. When you're praying and you, you using the prayer of thanksgiving, keep in mind that your actions well, how can, you, how can you let your action speak louder than your words? You know, when you really, when you, when you appreciate, if somebody gave you something and you appreciate it, you hug them. Wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you squeeze them. Like, oh, thank you. Because when you know that you shouldn't have had it or shouldn't have came your way and you're appreciative, it does something totally different to your spirit. 
And what many people have gotten into the cycle of, they say thank you, but they don't mean thank you. Mm -hmm. Remember he said, you draw nigh unto me with your lips, mm -hmm. but your heart is afar off. Mm -hmm. So when you speak, your lips and your heart have to match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prayer of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Now prayer of praise. Mm -hmm. Good psalm for that is 150. Psalms 150. Where it talks about um, praise him with this. Praise him, you know, it used praise him with the sound of a trumpet. Praise him with the sound of a harp. Praise him with instruments. Praise him on the piano. Praise him um, with the tambourine. Praise him with your hands. Mm -hmm. So a praise is almost like an applaud. You're giving him a standing ovation. You could be shouting, jumping. <laughs> Just, you know how y'all do at the football games? Yeah. <laughs> or basketball game. Or whatever you like, you know, right. boxing. Whatever your thing is. Everybody got their thing. Yeah. But it's an excitement that generates. So praise is more of an action than something you say. Because he said, let everything that have breath, breath. breath. Praise the Lord. so you could be screaming. It's all right to scream. Ah! And, you know, if you're screaming on the right team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you really you can have a, a, a prayer of praise. You, you can it. But most of the time, your prayer, when it comes to, it's going to be more of a prayer of thanksgiving than, than a prayer of praise. Because now, now that I've had, he, you know, kind of caused me to think a little bit more today. Okay. Uh, or gave me, I guess this was the class that needed it. See, every class couldn't, might, couldn't grab it, but this is a group of people that could grasp it and could use it. Okay. So, prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of praise. Now, here's one we really need to embrace. Confession and forgiveness. Confession is good for your soul. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you this. In your confession, be honest. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. He already know you anyway. Yep. So why are you trying to fool him? That's right. If you know you a low down dirty skunk, mm -hmm. tell him to clean you up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Father, I'm a low down dirty skunk. I ain't no higher than a, a worm. Mm -hmm. Father, raise me up, please. Mm -hmm. But if you already think you up here, why he going to touch you? So always take the low seat. Mm -hmm. They used to tell me, um, this is just a practice. When you come in to a new church, don't invite yourself up to the pulpit. Let them invite you up. Because right. mm -hmm. you invite yourself up, <laughs> they'll invite you down. Mm -hmm. Because it says something about you, <laughs> your right. arrogance. Yeah. Right. Nobody has arrived. Right. You would never hear me preaching, praying like I have arrived. I'm still trying to get there like you. I'm still striving. I'm still reaching. I'm still knocking. I'm still seeking. Because there's, there is so much to know and learn and experience with the Father. In a lifetime, you could never do it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, confession and forgiveness. Notice in the scripture, he asked for, Daniel asked for forgiveness for himself first, mm -hmm. yes. then for his people. Sometimes you can have sin that might have existed or somebody set in motion in a place. And we got to come, ask for forgiveness for ourselves, and then ask for forgiveness 
for what has happened in the setting. People don't believe that, but you have to. Because it, it's like a stain. It can be a stain. See, I don't know all, I don't know the history. But if you want it to be clean, you gotta ask for forgiveness. That's why he told you'll hear him praying a lot of times in scripture, you'll see him praying for what their fathers did, the forefathers. Their sin. Because sin goes to the third and fourth generation. So now, for the sake, we won't be asking you to do a prayer confession today. <laughs> or a prayer of forgiveness. It could open a can of worms. The intercession. Um, we, since most of us have been here, we might, you know, do a little intercessory. I don't know. I, I'll see what the Father say. Um, but, of course, we know intercession starts with the Father, comes to you, ends with the Father. So, someone he puts on your heart and mind. Or it could be a, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a person, could be a situation. Prayer petition, when you ask. Petition, you know when they um, come around, sign this petition. Sign this petition. It's when we're joining forces together. And going, remember he talked about if two or three should ask anything in my name? Let's, let's, let's join together in prayer. Because two is better than one and a threefold cord is not easily broken. That's in Ecclesiastes. So that strength in numbers. So if you have a prayer of a righteous man availed much, both we can get some righteous people. You see what I'm saying? We can get a, a group of righteous people working together. Righteousness exalts a nation. That's in Proverbs. But sin, the transgression of his law, is a reproach to any people. It doesn't matter who you are. He's looking for people that want to look, live in righteousness. So that prayer petition joining can be powerful. Now let's, let's talk briefly about unanswered prayers. Okay, there are three answers he can give you. Yes. yes. No, or wait. And you've got to make sure that you understand what he's saying. And don't misinterpret. If you don't understand, say, Father, show me. Go into a waiting mode until he show you. Don't move forward. Don't mistake a yes for, you know, people can, they want to hear a yes so bad. That you can tell them no, and they'll swear out you told them yes. Because that's what they want to hear so bad. Or you tell them yes, and they want to hear no so bad. So you've got to make sure that you are mentally and spiritually hearing the right answer. Don't try to force the answer. Well, I think, no, don't think. He don't pay you to think. <laughs> You're not getting paid to think. You're getting paid to live it. I'm going to be honest. I, I, I feel like I, I could hear the yes or the no, but the maybes, I, I would just be waiting, and so then I would draw my own conclusion. <laughs> After a while, of, I'd be like, well, you know, I just keep praying on the situation, and, but I don't hear yes and I don't hear no, so then I said, well, may, maybe it's a yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you, know you, said, you said, you said. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, she, she, I know. She, me. I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. Me. I, I mean, I, when he tell me no, I can hear no. Okay. When he tell me yes, I can hear yes. But then after I keep praying and I don't hear a yes or a no, I'd be like, well. Maybe he's saying yes. Maybe he's saying yes. Oh, okay. But I guess he was saying maybe and just keep praying. But after well, see, praying for a while, a for a time. there you go. The maybe is a wait. Okay, but see, I didn't know that until I came to the class a couple of weeks ago. I was like, okay, thank you, Father, because wait means wait, to wait, wait. right? But wait means wait. <laughs> the, mate is, the wait is a 
testing your patience. Okay, no, right. Problem. But see, I didn't know that until I came to the class a couple of weeks ago. And so and that, that that was a blessing mm -hmm. to me because, yeah. you know, that cleared up a whole lot of things, yeah. you know, going Cause you on always in think, me. You think that you're going to get a yes or a no. You never right. think of the way. See, I ain't yeah. think of a way. Mm -hmm. Well, if you if you remember, he said, "In your patience, mm -hmm. possess ye your soul." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So patience is still a virtue, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you not only do you have have to experience patience on that level, you got to be patient with one another, mm -hmm. because we're still some a lot of people are growing, mm -hmm. they're experiencing change, um, and change doesn't always come overnight. Change is a process. Mm -hmm. It's something that you learn through doing. Yes. Well, I, you know, I, that that's very really true because I, I've seen people um, recently not deal well with change, and when they don't deal well with change, they try to come up with excuses, trying to account for what what they're going through, mm -hmm. or why they're going through it. And so, you know, you know, I've asked the father recently to, you know, help me understand what what it is that he's putting me there for because usually when I hear it something go off in me it's like, right and I'm like uh, do you realize why you're going through that mm -hmm. and then when you start asking questions it makes them think about okay I've been going through the same thing over and over again I've been doing the same thing over and over again so I'm getting the same results change what you do that's right if you change I mean, if you pray and ask for the change then usually he gives you something different and you see results, but people don't always get that. People don't always understand the change mm -hmm. because he's trying to work something different within you. It people is. don't get it. They yeah. don't get it. They don't get it. Now we're just about at that time uh, where we where we'll start and we'll take volunteers for prayer. And, and since I think this is a um, uh, this group has been, everybody's been here before. Even Romeo. <laughs> We're going to ask for a little different type of prayer today. Let me see. Father, what, what prayer, what type of prayer do we need today? What, what type of prayer? Okay, okay. Let's, we, we'll do this. Uh, we'll pray. It'll be a, a prayer petition. But we're going to stick to a prayer petition for the church, for our local assembly. And, and what I want you to do, now listen, this, this is a more, little, little more advanced. Okay, I don't want you to pray a long prayer, because I will stop you. But what I want you to do, I want you, when you start your prayer, of course, I want you to start with our Father. And then I want you to thank Him. You know, I always want to give thanks. Then I want you to listen, just, just listen. And you don't have to listen for a long time. If he doesn't give you anything, that's fine. But I want you to listen and what he puts in your spirit to pray on behalf of this local assembly. That's what I want you to pray. Okay? So that's going to come from the heart. <clears throat> Pray for our needs, our needs here. Our gro it could be our growth here. It could be a number of things. But he, he will, when you start praying, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't try to think it in advance. When you start praying, he will let it flow through your heart. What we need here. Okay, y'all with me? Can you, can you handle it? Anybody scared? You don't have to go now. I'm not going to force anybody to go. But I tell you, when you do, when you, when you practice in this type of setting and you, you do it here, it'll help you overcome some fears and, and things that you might have not wanted to um, gravitate towards. And for the sake of us, we thank you for coming to the Hebrew prayer session.